Have you ever been involved in a physical altercation, a fight? How did you respond? What does the Bible say our response should be? Do we defend ourselves or do we turn the other cheek? Well, stay with us as we deal with that issue and many others as well. This is Steve Schwetz for the Through the Bible Radio Network, and you're listening to the Question and Answer Program with our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We hope that you'll be able to join us for the next 30 minutes as we learn from the wit and wisdom that Dr. McGee brought to answering the questions of his listeners. Let's go to our questions now. This first one comes to us from a listener in Birmingham, Alabama. He writes, In your comments on Exodus 24, you read twice where Moses and the others saw God. And then you stated that this was an error of translation, and what was actually seen was the manifestation of God. Later, in the same program, you speak about the tabernacle being built exactly like the one in heaven. You said you believed the Bible literally, and when it makes a positive statement, you accept it. It seems to me that you're not being consistent. Why do you maintain that God would not show his face to Moses or anyone else if he so desired? Very frankly, may I say that The way that I stated it, I'm sure that it sounded like I was being inconsistent. But I do not feel that I was, and I'll tell you why. That in the 24th chapter, as you've indicated, that there is the very clear statement that the children of Israel, they saw the Lord. And we're told that, and they saw the glory of the Lord. And... I believe that that is what is meant rather than that they saw God face to face. And my feeling is that you have put, I think, two scriptures together that do make me look just a little bit bad. But very frankly, I don't think that I ought to be put in that position. And now I'm going to tell you why. First of all, let's see what the Scripture itself says in the 24th chapter. Now, in verse 9, it says, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And twice there we have that. Now, at the beginning of this chapter, we have a reference to the glory of the Lord. And then the important one is in verse 16, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now, what was it that they saw? Did they see the person of God? First of all, let me say, they did not see the person of God because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth is what the Lord Jesus said. Now, here, what they saw, we're told what it was. They saw the God of Israel that was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. That is, the heavens, the creation of God, is what they saw. They saw the manifestation and the glory of God, because the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And we find that Later on, when Moses was seeking a blessing of God, why, we have him making a request. 
And we need to take that in mind in interpreting this passage of Scripture. And that's over in the 33rd chapter of Exodus. And I trust that you listen to my explanation of the 33rd chapter of Exodus, because in that we dealt with this, but I'll take it up here again, verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, Moses did not see the person of God, because God's a spirit. But he asked here, show me thy glory. And now God says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. So obviously these men back there did not see the face and person of God. So the interpretation is that they saw the glory or the manifestation of God because this is something that Moses here wanted to see again. Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Now, God doesn't have a literal hand, but he made the hand can do the, what the hand of man can do. And so God covered him there. No man, he says, can see God and live. So we have to interpret Scripture with Scripture. And we understand that when they saw God, they saw the manifestation. And the statement there is, they saw that which was the manifestation of God in creation, the heavens itself. And God says here that in verse 23 of chapter 33, And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. That is, you'd see the glory of God. And he couldn't even stand to look upon the glory of God. It had to be departing from him before he could see the glory of God. So I think that we were being consistent when we interpreted this passage of Scripture to say that they did not see a literal face, and that face did not appear until Jesus Christ came to this earth. The Word then was made flesh, and then you could see God. And he told Philip that in the upper room, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know who God is? You'll have to go to Jesus Christ, you see. So when we say that we interpret Scripture literally, we mean exactly that. And that means that you have to take all the Scripture, and you have to take it literally of what it says. And for that reason, we took the position that we did. Our next question comes to us from a listener in Los Angeles who writes, I'm struggling with the fundamental understanding of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. You stated that this commandment means thou shalt not murder, with the difference between kill and murder being that of planning. I understand that there is a thin line between kill and murder, but I don't know where it is. For instance, if a Christian is persecuted for their faith, then he is to turn the other cheek and go the second mile, or possibly die for his faith. But if a burglar enters your house, is it okay to kill him? When does a Christian turn the other cheek, and when does he raise his arm to kill the offender? Now, this party here has a great deal that's confused. They say that a Christian here is to turn the other cheek, and they're, of course, drawing that from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I want you to look at something that I trust might be very helpful to you today. The difference between kill and murder, or murder and to kill someone, is, I think, not as difficult to ascertain as you think it is. And you'll find that, that there's that difference today. In fact, our law courts make even a finer distinction. There is such a thing as accidental death for which you'd not be arrested. And then there is a, you can be arrested for manslaughter. That doesn't mean that you plan to kill somebody, 
but through your negligence or your carelessness or your sin, you kill somebody, like getting drunk. You can be and running over someone. That's manslaughter. Personally, I think that ought to be changed to murder, but nevertheless, it's called manslaughter today. Then there is that which is known as premeditated murder. Now, I think it's our law courts make that distinction. Now, in the Scripture, you will find that the distinction is made between that which is premeditated and that, of course, which is accidental. The Scripture tells us about Moses gives us the illustration of two men that went out in the woods to cut wood. And one man, as he cut the wood, the handle, the axe on the end of the handle slipped off, hit the other one. Well, it may be that that fellow that was killed had a hot-headed brother that say, well, now this fellow had it against my brother all the time. When they got out there in the woods, why, he's killed him, and he's tried to make it appear as an accident. Well, that fellow, of course, that had killed him accidentally, could flee to a city of refuge where he would get a very fair hearing before the elders, and it would be ascertained and determined, and this other man couldn't touch him, of course, while he's there in the city of refuge. He's protected there. Actually, it was God protecting a man that had been accused of being a murderer. But there is another case where a man plans and plots to kill another, as the brothers of Joseph did. They plotted to put him to death, you know. And that, of course, is premeditated murder. Now, the sixth commandment that says thou shall not kill has to do with premeditated murder. It doesn't have anything to do with those that are killed accidentally. You might get in your car, as a father did the other day, backed out the driveway, and he backed over his little son. Well, he didn't mean to do that. He wouldn't have done that for anything in the world. In fact, that had been the last thing that this father would have done. But in the course of events, he did it. Now, he killed his son. He killed his son just as much as if he had gone in the house and got a gun and pointed at the boy and pulled the trigger. The boy was just as dead from being run over by the car. But you see the motive of the father. Now, that's the thing that makes the difference between to kill and to murder. Entire distinction as far as the word of God is concerned. Now, you say here that if somebody reviles you and physically persecutes you for your belief in Jesus the Christ, our Savior, then you're to turn the second cheek and to go the second mile. Well, I don't quite find the connection of the Sermon on the Mount with your testimony for Christ. I Don't quite get your connection there. I think you're putting together two things that do not belong together. The Sermon on the Mount will be in existence when our Lord's reigning here on this earth. Now, its great principles are for today. And if you understand this to turn your cheek and to go the second mile, that it has to do with a burglar breaking in your home. Well, in the first place, why do you have a lock on your door? Why don't you turn the cheek to him before he even breaks in? Why don't you make it easy for him? And I have never yet found one of these dreamers, these millennial dreamers, these modernistic interpreters of Scripture, yet that wouldn't have a lock on his door. I remember being in Chicago with a friend of mine, and I say he's a friend of mine, and he became a liberal, by the way. And I went out to see him at his church. And when we were leaving, why, we were still talking and went out the door. He said to me, he says, you know, I believe that the Sermon on the Mount is for today and we ought to start practicing it. That's what he said. And all at the same time, he was locking the door to his office. And he didn't have one lock on it. I've only got one. He had two. And he was locking both of them. And I said to him, well, why in the world then are you locking your door? Well, he said, to keep somebody from breaking in. Well, I said, I thought you just said that we're living in a Sermon on the Mount. Well, he said, we are. Well, I said, then take your locks off. I said, Sermon on the Mount says, resist not evil. And why are those locks on there if they're not to resist evil? They're a nuisance otherwise because you always got to look in your pocket and find the key, and sometimes you can't find the key, and it makes it pretty bad in fact, when you can't find your key, the only fellow that can get into your place is the burglar 
are the thief. You see, all of us believe in resisting evil. And the reason that we believe it, because we're living in this present evil world. Now, we can resist evil. And personally, the burglar that breaks in is to be dealt with summarily. I don't say that you're to shoot him down. I don't know where you got that. But I do say this, that when he breaks in, why, you're to protect your goods. The Lord Jesus said, a strong man arm keepeth his house. And that's the way that you're to do it, is to protect what you have. Now, this part, it says here, when are we to turn the other cheek? And when are we to raise his arm to slay the offender? May I say to you that I do not personally think that today that we are to turn the other cheek, literally. I can't see that. I don't believe that today. If some fellow knocks you down, are you going to get up and hold out the other cheek to him? I heard of the Irishman that did that, and then when he was knocked down the second time, he got up and punched the fellow good. And somebody said, well, why in the world did you do that? You turn the other cheek. Yeah, but said, I wasn't told what to do after I turned the other cheek. So it's a good thing this Irishman didn't have a half a dozen cheeks. The important thing is there's a great principle there for believers, and we're told not to avenge ourselves, and you'll get that in the 12th chapter of Romans. But we are to protect ourselves, and we're told to live peaceably with all men as much as we're able. Now, there's some people you can't live peaceably with. You just have to face that sort of thing, and you're going to have trouble with it. Therefore, in this present evil age, it's well to keep a lock on your house, on your valuables, on your automobile, and it's well to protect yourself in this present evil age in which we live. We're told to do that. Now, the principles of the Sermon on the Mount are fine for today, but if you're living by the Sermon on the Mount, my brother, you are certainly faced with more than one inconsistency, and this just happens to be one of them, by the way that you've mentioned today. The whole thought is that when it says, Thou shalt not kill, it means thou shalt not deliberately, premeditatively murder. You shall not do that. Now, if you accidentally run over somebody, you've killed them. And, but that's not breaking that commandment, so I understand. It's a serious thing, of course, and they're just as dead as if you'd planned it. But it's the heart condition. That's the important thing. We have another question also from Los Angeles. This listener writes, I once heard you speak about the names and titles of Christ used in the Bible. Could you again elaborate on the difference in using Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus, and Lord Jesus? Now, let me first of all say that the connection in which we were calling attention to this was that Paul's custom was always to put Christ ahead of Jesus. It was Christ Jesus and not Jesus Christ always to Paul, where it was the custom of the other writers. For instance, John, in his marvelous gospel that presents even the deity of Christ, he emphasizes and uses the word Jesus. You'll notice that in his gospel, the gospel of John. Now, may I say this, that Jesus is his human name. When he came to this earth, it was said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the name that he got when he came here. Now, Christ is just the Greek form of the Hebrew Messiah, and both of them mean anointed. That was the Messiahship. He was the one in David's line. And that, of course, to the Jew was the highest title. Now, our explanation had to do with why Paul put Christ ahead of Jesus whereas the other apostles put Jesus ahead of Christ. You see, the other disciples knew him in the days of his flesh. They knew him as the one they met as Jesus. Paul never knew him as Jesus. That is, to him he was his enemy. I think he saw him probably at the crucifixion he was present, but he hated Jesus. He did not know him. He came to know him. He went on the Damascus road and found out he'd come back from the dead and that he was the Christ. And then Paul could write, though we did know him after the flesh, we no longer know him after the flesh. In other words, Paul did not emphasize Jesus' side. He emphasized Christ. And that's the reason that I think that he puts it first in so many cases. Not always, but even in like in the epistle to the Ephesians, many places where our translation has Jesus first, it should be Christ. 
because that was Paul's way of speaking of him, because he met him, you see, after his death and resurrection, whereas the other apostles met him when they were called there by the Sea of Galilee and in other places. They knew him in the days of his flesh. Paul did not, and Jesus is the name of emphasis in the days of his flesh, you see. So I think that's the reason that you find Paul putting the emphasis there, because he said we know him no longer after the flesh. We don't know him today as just Jesus. We know him today as Christ Jesus. And you'll find Paul even calling him the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to Paul the Lord of glory. And that is the place of emphasis and the point of emphasis that this man made again and again in his ministry. And then a listener from Fontana, California asks, could you speak to the issue of Easter and sunrise services used in churches today? Well, let me say that as far as Easter is concerned, it is true that Easter has accretions of time added to it and also of superstition and paganism. Well, actually, a great deal of Easter celebration, especially with rabbits and eggs and colored eggs and that sort of thing, that's absolutely Babylonish. That's pagan and heathen to the very core. But for the Christian, why, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And I feel that we should take advantage of that day because it's rather a matter of, well, it's a joke today that a great many people never go to church except at Easter. Well, that crowd wouldn't go at all if there wasn't for an Easter. So we need to take advantage of Easter Sunday and attempt to make as much of it as we can in the sense of preaching the gospel and especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I feel like that as a believer, we need to take advantage of it and we need to make a great deal of it. Now you ask about the sunrise service. I'm Take it for granted, you mean the Easter sunrise service? Well, actually, friends, that Easter sunrise service is just a fad that is spread across America the past few years. I don't know what it is in human nature that all year long they can't get up in time to go to 11 o'clock service and sit in a comfortable church, but for some strange reason they can get up before daylight on Easter Sunday morning and go out on a hillside and stand there and shiver and half freeze to death and somehow or another think they're discharging their obligation to God and that somehow or another they've done something quite wonderful. Well, if the gospel is preached in those services and the unsaved hear the gospel, I'm for it. And if that's the only place we can get them out to listen to the gospel, fine and well enough. But if you want to know my private opinion of the Easter sunrise service, I don't think it's worth the snap of your fingers. I don't think it's worth anything at all. I feel like in many occasions it's a waste of time that it honestly doesn't amount to very much. But if there is an opportunity of proclaiming the gospel to unsaved people, then sunrise or sunset, I would say hallelujah, let's get the gospel out. But just to have a service like that, I don't think there's much value to it, and I do not see why today that there's been so much made of it. Do you have a question about a passage of Scripture in the Bible? Perhaps you'd like to have a better understanding of the doctrines taught in the Word of God, or maybe you'd like to do an in-depth study on a particular book of the Bible. Well, we can help you. We have a large number of books, booklets, CDs, and more that we make available to our listeners as they can grow and mature in their faith. If you'd like to have a copy of our resource catalog, then request one when you call 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Now, today's broadcast is available on an individual CD, which can be ordered online at ttb.org or by calling one of our service operators at 1-800-652-4253, Monday through Thursday, from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. On a final note, let me remind you to join us this week on the Through the Bible radio program as we continue Dr. McGee's five-year journey through the whole Word of God, book by book and chapter by chapter. 
as you study along with the broadcast, you may find that you'd like to prepare in advance for the daily lessons. Well, Dr. McGee prepared notes and outlines for such a purpose. If you believe that you'll find them to be useful, then we'd like to add you to our mailing list for notes and outlines and our monthly newsletter. You can do so by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime using our internet order form at ttb.org or by writing to questions and answers in the U.S. Box 7100, Pasadena, California 91109, in Canada Box 25325, London, Ontario N6C 6B1. Now until this time next week, we leave you with the prayer that God will answer all your questions and solve all your problems. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network. Thank you.